Uh, thank you everyone again for coming. My name is Jay Josker. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at Canisius High School. With me as always is our Vice President of the Alumni Board, Spencer Farrell from the class of 2008. Uh, today we have Leo Rocco from the class of 94. Leo is a successful entrepreneur based out in San Francisco. He is the founder of the app Pago. If you have ever ordered coffee on Starbucks app, you have used technology Leo has built. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Leo. Take it away, sir. Thanks, Jay. Much appreciated. And uh, um, welcome, everybody. Uh, out here on the West Coast, it's uh, it's 2 p.m. So uh, you know it's still uh, it's still afternoon, and we have an incredibly sunny day, which I believe it's uh, beautiful and sunny in Buffalo. So I uh, was just connecting with my parents earlier today on my run, and and, and they're still out there in uh, the suburb of uh, of West Seneca. So uh, glad to be here. Glad to um, you know have the CHS community uh, uh, invite me. Uh, I'm in my office, and uh, a few things you can't see are uh, my signed Jim Kelly helmet, because, you know, I graduated in 94. So as you recall, it was likely some of the best four years of being a Buffalo Bills fan in the history of being a Buffalo Bills fan. Until this year, because Josh Allen is going to take us all away. Right, so I wanted to make sure that you guys understood where I, where I, uh, where I am with respect to uh, my football, and I'm making a, 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 you know, I was talking to a, a, a bunch of folks, and I said, Super Bowl this year, Bills against Niners, and Josh Allen pulls off the biggest win of his career, score, 27-24. 27-24, Bills win. That's my prediction because, because we're going to play football this year. Um, so, guys, I am from the class of 94. I was also a football player. I was the backup punter and the third-string quarterback. Uh, I did better holding the, uh, the clipboard. I was the better clipboard holder, and I helped, uh, I helped the, uh, the athletes pass math class. Uh, and took uh, more notes than, than you could ever imagine for people. So it was a lot of fun, enjoyed it. I have a couple slides I wanna kinda share with you and I'll, I'll, I'll be ba bouncing between slide share and, um, and the, uh, the video. So just hold on one second, I'm just gonna share the screen. One second here, bear with me as we kinda figure this out. Let's see, I think I have it. Let's see, where did I put it here? There, and click on that. Okay, so here, I'm gonna go ahead and just uh, share my screen. Let's see if I know how to do this. I, I guess I am a technology guy. All right, good. Can you see my screen? Sure can. Okay, so we're gonna go in, in, in uh, presentation mode here. So, uh, so you know, um, you know, I, I uh, uh, sponsored uh, Gambit last year, and my hope is that there's a Gambit this year so I can, you know, uh, participate again. Uh, but this is a, um, a small little sort of, uh, you know, I forgot, uh, what, what, you know, little ad that we included, uh, I think, last year, and I, 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 I think we're going to do it again this year. Uh, so my brother and I both graduated from, from Canisius. Um, and, uh, and he was class of 90, I'm class of 94, um, you know, and, 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 and really it's my dad and his business being a tailor in Orchard Park, New York, um, and, uh, and really taking the feedback from several families, several of his customers being in, being in Orchard Park that were, that either I'd sent their, 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 their kids to Canisius or were going to send their kids to Canisius uh, and really, um, you know, that's really what influenced him to send my brother there, uh, you know, class of 90. Uh, my brother was, you know, uh, a great athlete. You know, he was incredible. He was a, a running back, kick returner. Uh, he wasn't the backup punter or the third string quarterback like I was. So he was the athlete of the family. Um, he's done incredibly well in Chicago. 
Uh, but we together, um, you know, one of the things that really inspired us and continue to inspire us, you know, 30 some odd years later is, uh, is, 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 is what Father Zanoni uh, had ingrained in us, uh, I believe it was uh, freshman year, uh, and even prior for that matter. Uh, and again, something that you guys should know very well, uh, pursue excellence, nothing else is worth your time. Pursue excellence, nothing else is worth your time. So, um, you know, and listen, I mean, you know, if there's any takeaway from the four years, if you can take that away, you know, you're a winner, right? So, so, so those words continue to inspire on everything that, uh, that I do, that my brother does, uh, uh, it's basically, you know, the meaning of our family. You know, uh, my, my parents being Italian immigrants coming here with nothing and, uh, you know, being entrepreneurs and, 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 and being able to, uh, to send us to, to, to schools like, like Canisius. Um, and listen, I mean, this is just a statement, but, uh, but as a family, as a family, we truly have a heartfelt gratitude for, for the Canisius High School experience. We, we, we really believe that. And, uh, and, C and CHS will always be, you know, uh, an extension to our family. So that's, that's uh, very heartfelt, very true. Uh, um, uh, uh, we're just very happy, um, you know, to support the school in, uh, in any way possible, right? So, so I want to share that with you. Uh, a couple slides. Um, but listen, I mean, let me uh, just share with you a little bit about, you know, uh, my journey, right? Uh, how I ended up here to the West Coast. To be honest with you, it's still a surprise to me that, that I'm even out here, you know, being, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, being from Buffalo, West Seneca. Uh, you know, what I recall of the West Coast was, if you recall Super Bowl it was in 1984, 1984, and it was the Miami Dolphins against the San Francisco 49ers. And I remember sitting in my living room with my dad, and I said, Dad, I go, where is San Francisco? He said, it's so far away. It's, you, it's, just, it's as far as Italy. I'm like, you're kidding me. Oh, my God. I was just so amazed, right? Um, so, uh, so not even knowing, you know, where it was, right, at age, you know, however old I was, eight or nine years old, whatever, uh, at, at the time. Uh, but it's just amazing that, you know, uh, it's, it's really amazing where your journey takes you, right? You know, uh, it can take you uh, to different parts of the world. It can take you on different paths in your career. Um, you know, I was very fortunate enough to, uh, um, to really... Uh, you know, going to engineering school at uh, Kettering in Michigan. Uh, truth that matters, I didn't want to be an engineer. Um, I don't even know what an engineer was. Uh, but, but being at Canisius, um, it was Father Zimper, really, that motivated me to get into computer programming. And um, I know that, you know, he's no longer with us, um, you know, but, uh, but it really, you know, I would, I would, you know, as, you know, being a thir 13, 14 year old, right, you'd get jugged. And um, because we had so much energy in us, we just didn't know how to express that energy, right? So, um, so you know, we cleaned the, the school. And I remember, um, you know, we'd had to come, we, we had to come in for Saturday jug. And it was the winter uh, of like 90, you know, uh, 91, I think it was. Um, and, um, and Father Zimper had a book about learning HTML. It was a book. He said, learn this, because this is going to be a big deal one day. I said, huh. I said, but computers, oh my God, there was a, a stereotype. If you're a computer guy, you're a geek. You know, you know there's a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of ignorance around that, you know. Um, but, uh, but listen, so, you know, it was jug. You know, I'd rather spend reading than out there cleaning. You know, who wouldn't, right? Um, so, uh, so started to read the book and I started, and he set me up in his office and I, I don't know if you remember his office, it was up the, the spiral staircase. He had a little closet. It was so small, so small. And, uh, set me up on the computer and I, uh, and I learned how to, I learned how to code. Um, I mean, what are the chances, 
right? You know, uh, you know, being basically, you know, the dawn of the internet, right? Uh, and, 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 and who knew that that was going to be happening uh, in 2000, right? And all that activity. Uh, but, um, but essentially, you know, that led me into then, uh, you know, being interested. I thought it was a hobby, actually, computer programming. It really wasn't a career, you know, who knew that you can actually go ahead and make money on this thing, right? So it was just kind of a fun thing to do, right? Um, so uh, <laughs> it was an interesting story with my, with my dad, but anyhow, but um, so, uh, so listen, so I went on and I, I really followed my brother's footsteps because he was an incredible role model being class of 90. He went on to, to Kettering University. He became a mechanical engineer. My dad was like, you're going to become a mechanical engineer whether you like it or not. I'm like, what do I know? I guess I'll go. Uh, if you've ever been to Flint, Michigan, it's not one of the most desirable places to go. Uh, Flint, Michigan, you know, it was, uh, uh, but, but nonetheless, there was a tremendous amount of focus. And, um, and, you know, and that focus was great because, because um, listen, I mean, you know, when you're in college, you can kind of go out and party and, and um, a lot of folks, you know, lose themselves, right? So I was fortunate have some great mentorship um, and, uh, and, and, a, and a partial road being paved by my brother, Mike. Um, so, so, so really that, that, you know, going through the program and being enlightened by different folks from different areas. Um, you know, it was amazing was that, you know, uh, unfortunately, Buffalo isn't as diverse culturally, you know, as, as a lot of other places, you know, um, you know, pretty much everyone's Catholic, you know, and, uh, and uh, right, so, 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 but, you know, when you go to school, you know, and, and, and you go outside Buffalo, you begin to, you know, experience, you know, um, other cultures, um, other types of people from all over the world that, that I had never been to, right, um, you know, so, so just an amazing experience, eye-opening experience, and I happen to, you know, get together with a group of folks that, uh, you know, we, we, we really weren't troublemakers. Uh, we tried to get into trouble, but how much trouble, trouble can you get into at, a, at an all engineering school? Um, you know, uh, wasn't, uh, it wasn't Michigan or, or, or Michigan State, it was Kettering, which was a school that was primarily a, um, an engineering school, right? And uh, so it was a really, a, it was a, just a larger high school, to be honest with you, with the focus on, on, on engineering. So, uh, so anyhow, so uh, continued on, you know, got my degrees in mechanical engineering and MIS, uh, created this program called Pro Professor. It was the first online learning system for pro engineer. Um, you know, was able to, 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 to sell that to a company called Parametric Technology while I was in college, which then led to uh, opening up other doors, right? And this is now we're talking about, you know, 1997, 1998, which was a huge acceleration in, uh, in, in the internet. People are like, oh my God, what's happening out there? So I was able to, 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 to meet some pretty interesting people who, uh, who also helped accelerate, um, you know, my adoption of the internet and, uh, uh, and, 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 and to really get into that whole scene. Um, you know, graduated in, uh, you know, early in 98, uh, walked in 99, um, but, uh, but uh, and, then, and then moved to Boston, you know, and then in Boston, um, continued to work for parametric technology, um, was uh, you know you know one of the youngest executives at that company, um, and then a buddy of mine said, "Hey, come out west," you know, his buddy of mine that uh, from college, and so uh, joined him in San Francisco, um, um, you know, through Chicago, and um, and really you know, you know he had founded a company. We sold that company to IBM, and then and then and then I got the itch to be an entrepreneur and really kind of do this thing on my own. Um, so. So uh, that's when, you know, I came up with the idea of, you know, ordering really a beer from your chair at, uh, at the baseball park. I, uh, um, I'm not sure if you, it's, 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 you, you can Google it, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I missed Barry Bonds record hitting home run because I was at the concession stand getting beers for my buddies. And uh, it was interesting because, um, you know, we were talking about it. I'm like, oh man, this sucks that. I got to get up out of my seat, you know, and because uh, everyone was like, oh my God, this guy got a hit or not. And he was about eight from bat, right? Um, 
it was almost like watching Matt Carver in 1994 hit a home run at Pilot Field. You remember that, Matt Carver? How exciting was that? I was in the stands when you hit that. It was amazing, right? But this was Barry Bonds, you know? So, so, um, so anyhow, so I was getting a beard, missed it, and I was like, I'm doing it. I'm going to start a company, um, you know, and, and, and more inspiration on top of that. Anyways, that first company failed miserably. I spent a lot of money, uh, burned a lot of relationships, and um, failed miserably at that company. Uh, it was text messaging 2006, 2007. Um, we really couldn't get adoption of it. Uh, we thought that, hey, people would want to buy girls drinks via text message. How off could we have been? You know, um, we were pretty off, you know, uh, nobody wanted to text message uh, a girl a drink, right? Um, uh, uh, so anyhow, so that evolved further. We didn't give up on the idea, or I rather, I didn't give up on the idea. Uh, the band broke up and, 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 and I continued the journey on my own, right? So then uh, brought some, you know, inspired some additional folks, brought them together. And uh, the idea was, well, hey, you know, why not be able to uh, create an app you know, iPhone app, Android app, so you could be poolside, you know, or you could be at your hotel room uh, to order a drink. So, uh, so for, you know, a few friends of mine, we went down to Las Vegas, it was a weekend, and uh, we were, we, we went to this pool party. For those of you that have been to Las Vegas, for a time, there's these big pool parties. Uh, well, listen, we're engineers, we're geeks, we, we, we don't have the muscles of these, uh, you know, these folks, you know, if you ever watched those reality TV shows, these guys, you know, and everyone out there, we had our shirts on, we were kind of embarrassed, you know, uh, but anyhow, so, um, so, uh, uh, you know, we actually <laughs> put our laptops out and started to code this app with thousands of people <laughs> around us. <laughs> so, uh, and then I tried to, um, I tried to get the, uh, the, the, the executive leadership of the Hard Rock Hotel. Like, you know, you guys got to get all over. This is huge. You know, anyways, they, they, they blew me off, but I was persistent. I flew down to Las Vegas every single week and I stand, I stood outside this guy's door at the Hard Rock Hotel. This guy's name, his name was Phil Shalala. And um, nothing. And I'm like, I'm like, this guy's got to take a meeting. And uh, one day I got him and I said, hey, Phil, uh, or I said, no, Mr. Shalala, I, I, I need just 15 minutes. I'm from Silicon Valley, I have this new product, and, 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 and I, want you guys, I want you to partner with me. He's like, you got five minutes. Showed him the app. He's like, I love it, we gotta do it. So that meeting, it was for five minutes, turned out to be three hours, you know? Um, and, uh, and he said, how else can I help? I go, first off, I go, can you, uh, you know, can you give me a room tonight? Because uh, I missed the last flight. So uh, that'll really help out because we're, you know, because we're starving entrepreneurs. So, so, so help us out with that. And then we started to code more and, and essentially created this app, you know, went through the whole cycle of raising capital, et cetera, which led us to uh, JP Morgan, uh, which invested 13.5 million in the initial round of the company. At the time, one of the largest uh, Series A rounds, um, you know, you know in, in, in Silicon Valley. And, uh, and then further developed it. And, uh, and then we had the Starbucks opportunity. We actually created the Starbucks app without Starbucks permission. And, um, and uh, you know, what was interesting is that I, I paid under the table, the manager of, of, of the three Starbucks locations to say, hey, just keep us there and take the orders if someone opens it up. And if you do it, I'll pay a hundred bucks a week. And, you know, it was great. They did it, you know, and, 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 and the most important thing is they did it. And actually that's how we got into JP Morgan was one of their executives ordered the order to order a, a coffee on Castro street in Mountain View and went there and the coffee was ready, sitting ready, waiting while the Starbucks is packed. So that, so that was the big closer. There wasn't no fancy presentation. There was no fancy revenue model, financial model. It was that. It was that euphoric experience of skipping the line and ordering a coffee. 
Um, and listen, I mean, I don't know. We could have gotten several cease and desist orders from Starbucks. I don't know. I was on the verge of being evicted from my apartment, so I wasn't really getting my mail. Uh, but, then, but then we end up getting a, 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 you know, one of them, uh, one, one, one cease and desist. And then, you know, and then we kind of official because we had raised money and share with my board. And then Jamie Dimon reached out to Howard Schultz. And uh, so instead of, you know, telling us to go away, then it turned out to be an investment and a partnership. And, and we ended up developing that app uh, version one for Starbucks um, with Adam Brobman, the, uh, chief, the chief digital officer and, 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 and team. So uh, pretty exciting opportunity. And we were on the cusp of something, uh, something pretty, pretty significant. But who, you know, who, who would have known? But listen, running a company is tough. You can't just create a good app. You got to actually set up customers, do it consistently. You have to become, listen, at some point, you know, you got to become profitable. Um, and that was a challenge for us, you know, in our, in, in our deal with JP Morgan Chase, you know, they moved slower than we thought. We raised another, another 14 to $15 million. Uh, we were operating and then we, we were in, in relationships with Amazon and Google and a host of other companies and for me, it was like, do you keep it, do you sell it, or do you um, raise more money? You know, what do you do? So for us, uh, for me, you know, and, and the benefit of the team, I thought that selling the company as an acqui-hire and IP transaction uh, to, uh, to um, an acquire was the way to, the way to go. And that's, uh, and that's ultimately what, what led us to, uh, to Amazon. Um, you know, and, and as part of that deal, um, there are about 40 of us in a, joining Amazon. I joined in an advisory capacity, and uh, I'm proud to say that I made 40 plus people millionaires. Um, so it was inc incredibly exciting to be able to do that and, and, and fulfilling, which then led me to, um, you know, the opportunity that I'm in today, which is I am the chief product development officer of a hundred billion dollar, 50,000 person company that is called Pfizer, uh, which was formerly called First Data. So if you pretty much, if you're on Main Street America and you process credit cards, we likely process your credit cards. If you go to a bank, M&T Bank, they're powered by our, by, by our software. So I lead a team of 7,000 people globally. Uh, how did I get that job? Well, the, uh, the CEO and uh, the president were on the board of my company when they were at JP Morgan. So they were uh, very impressive with, with, with what I was doing and, and uh, I was looking to go ahead and make a move and, and they said, come on over and fix the company for us. So, um, so I did that, you know, and uh, it was incredibly exciting, incredibly rewarding, uh, both um, rewarding from a career perspective and rewarding economically. Uh, helped uh, take the company public uh, as part of an IPO on the New York Stock Exchange. And then um, I was an integral member in helping complete the, um, uh, the $22 billion uh, transaction that we did with Fiserv um, uh, earlier, uh, rather uh, last year. So uh, pretty cool stuff. Um, huge opportunity, you know, lots of pain and tears along the way. Uh, incredible moments of happiness and elation. Uh, can't describe to you how exciting it is when, you know, um, when you know you're on the verge of having zero money and looking for pennies in your couch, uh, and next thing you know, you score a big investment from J.P. Morgan, uh, and then and then another one, and then a deal with Amazon, and then a you know a, an IPO with, uh, with 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 First Data, uh, and then and then you realize you're like wow you're like you know um, companies are really messed up, you know, and this is why they get disrupted every day. You know, so you're in a room with 50 people and I'm not kidding you, you know, everyone's looking at you for the answer. So you have to go ahead and create a, and create the strategy. You can't just sit there quietly, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not a quiet guy to begin with, but, but, um, but, but essentially, you know, setting the strategy, be a leader, inspire people, um, which then ultimately created to, uh, uh, led to rather uh, the formalization of a methodology that uh, that I formalized called the R5 method. So you go to r5method.org. So basically, R5 method, uh, which has five foundational principles for developing products. Um, you know, because I'm kind of an expert, right? So 
So number one is uh, transparency, right? Um, and in fact, here, let me, uh, let me just share my screen again uh, for the benefit of the group. Because you know you don't want to just hear me talk, and you want to see a, a couple things. <clears throat> All right, so you guys check it out. Again, it's a uh, in progress, right? But essentially, you know, uh, it's it's about transparency, right? Be transparent, tell the truth, share challenges quickly, don't sugarcoat. Number two, take action. Don't let things get stale, right? Take action, resolve challenges quickly and efficiently, right? R3, accountability. Accept accountability, own it, right? You know, not just for your piece of the process, but the product as a whole. R4, participation. Give full participation every single day. Don't be a bum. Right, be prepared, report status, log time, right? Yeah, understand what did you do? What's blocking you? What's the next step? And five, and I think most important, you know, championing a positive, you know, winning attitude because it's because it sets the, the, the tone for the team and the company. So essentially, you know, it's an equation that I created, which is the summation of R1 plus R2 plus R3 plus R4 plus R5. Imagine Mr. O'Connor's math class, you know, equals maximum productivity. So it's an equation that I created um, and essentially a, uh, a model that I have. Visit it, check it out. It's open source, it's available to the community. And, uh, and the reason why I, uh, I did that uh, is because I found that companies are terrible at developing products. Not all companies, clearly we have some amazing companies you know, that do an amazing job. But for the most part, uh, a lot of companies are just not good at it. They, you have more talkers than anything, more people attending meetings than anything. You know, companies don't hire you to attend meetings. They hire you to be productive and, and, and to create something. So um, anyways, it's part of the methodology. Uh, along with this, by the way, uh, this is being introduced in, in, a, in a book that I'm publishing in July. The book is called Winning at Product Development. Uh, we pre-sold we, we pre 70,000 copies uh, to, the, to, the, to the FinTech world. Um, and uh, uh, we'll be, you know, kind of making sure that, that, that you guys are, are, are taken care of. Here's the thing, the, 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 the book, it's for nonprofit, you know? So all the proceeds from the book go to supporting programs to motivate kids to code. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm personally starting off with a million dollars of my own personal uh, capital uh, to fund the cause and then uh, looking to go ahead and take further proceeds from the book um, to go ahead and, and, uh, and, and further drive that. So, uh, so and, and also be partnering with, uh, uh, with uh, Kenesius' own Eric Amadeo. So Eric, tremendous individual, classmate of mine, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, and and, and we're, we're looking to we're looking to really make an impact uh, across the country, motivate kids to code, setting up you know various uh, uh, um, you know championships like like a robotics championship, a drone championship where, where we drive kids to code, right? Because coding is as important as learning English, right? You know it's not a geek thing to do. Everything is becoming smart, everything. Everything around you is becoming smart, right? So coding is incredibly important. So we have to really get that in to at the high school level, right? And really help create that foundation because it's something that will be with them for the rest of their lives. So, um, you know, so, it's, so that's coming, stay tuned. Stay tuned then, we'll provide the tools and the funding and uh, it's going to be it's going to be a really fun thing for us to do. Uh, for the first championship, you know, uh, I'm going to put up ten thousand dollars to see whoever is able to go ahead and follow the process in and win, right? But listen, we got a million dollars to play with, so we can do a lot of really interesting stuff, right? And hopefully more. Hopefully we can raise ten million dollars, right, on this thing. So, uh, so yeah, that's the idea behind it, right? Um, is to make an impact, motivate kids to code. 
change people's lives. Father Zimper changed my life by introducing me to HTML programming, right? My, my, my parents' customers in Orchard Park, New York, changed our lives by motivating my father to send us to Canisius. And another customer motivated my dad to send my brother to Kettering University. So, so all these things happen and it's amazing, you know, to learn about people's journeys. Um, and that's really my journey, you know. Um, what I also want to do, we, we, we have about 26 minutes left. Um, you know, uh, I wanted to read you uh, a, a, a passage from the book, right? And this passage is about, you know, Buffalo. It's about uh, my parents. Um, it's a passage that I think is, uh, is heartfelt. And, uh, and really summarizes, you know, getting to know, you know, uh, who I am and what I'm all about. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll open it up for questions. How does that sound? Good? Sounds great. All right, great. Okay. So, so here's the thing, right? So um, let me read the section here about, uh, about essentially, you know, right after my intro, which talks about really my maniacal attention to detail. Because I'm, uh, listen, I have, I, I'm obsessive compulsive to like an nth degree, right? Um, you know, my wife uh, deals with it and, and she, you know, sometimes she's like, time out, right? Just reset. But, you know, um, it's proved out to be a superpower for me obsessive compulsiveness, right? Uh, you know, and I, 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 I try to aim it for good, not for evil, right? <laughs> so um, let's get started. So, so this is my chapter one, right? Devil is in the details, right? Devil is in the details. So I grew up in Buffalo, New York, the son of a tailor. And when your dad has an occupation that's all about detail, you tend to become more detail aware. And I may not have been type A through nature, However, I became type A through nurture. And there was always the attempt to perfect something from learning arithmetic to the conjugation of verbs to learning battles of war and history. Perfection is not that you just memorize things for the short term, is that you truly learned them and understood what you learned. So when it came time to decide which high school my brother and I were going to attend, it was without hesitation, the Canisius High School in Buffalo, New York because Canisius's motto was pursue excellence, nothing else is worth your time. That motto is what won over dad. This mindset carried over to everything that we did and how he and mom raised us. And although he had never gone to high school, he felt this motto represented the rigor he experienced during his apprenticeship in Sicily, which created the foundation for the unknowns of life. It all started for dad in Palermo, Italy, where he began his apprenticeship at Lepanto Tailors. This shop was the premier tailor shop in Palermo. It's like learning the craft of acting from the Juilliard School in New York or learning martial arts from the Shangzhen Academy in China. Lepanto catered to the very top of society, celebrities, heads of state, heads of business. They would all get their clothes made there. This sort of bespoke apparel was the rigueur of 1940s, 50s Palermo, and, uh, and, 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 and men would not buy suits off the rack. That was introduced in the late 60s. So getting custom-made apparel was the only option. And because of this rigorous program at Lepanto, the Lepanto trained tailors were the creme de la creme of tailors. They used old work techniques. They never cut corners. The aesthetic was similar to that of an engineer who solves mathematical problems in longhand or with a slide rule instead of using a calculator. That's why so many of the tailors at Lepanto would eventually get opportunities to work as some of the largest and most revered garment manufacturers all over the world. Eventually, in 1965, my father's path led him to New York City and New York City's garment district. And, new, and not too far along after that, he met an entrepreneur in the garment industry that understood my father's talent and subsequently motivated him to set up shop in Orchard Park, New York. When my father opened up shop during 1980, 
the OP was an upscale community and the clientele included heads of business and local governments. Suits were the dress code and they were worn daily. It was the perfect setting for a true master tailor. And in town, there were two other tailor shops that serviced the community. Each of them had operated for more than 15 years prior to my father's arrival. The clientele was unaware that there could be anything better and were satisfied with what these two tailors offered. However, my father offered old world high quality craftsmanship that people couldn't get anywhere else. In addition to the high quality craftsmanship, he had a great partner in my mother, who was also a tailor and handled women's apparel. Mom's work ethic was just as intense as dad's. She also was a driving force on delivery, always striving to get projects done ahead of time. The two of them had a one-two punch that proved unstoppable. Customers took notice and the business grew exponentially. In a matter of years, my parents drove the other two tailor shops out of business. Their product quality was incredible. Their customer service was top notch. And because of their incredible work ethic, they always beat customer expectations. It was a challenge for anyone to compete. And for a period of time, dad was the only tailor in town and had total market ownership. And during these years, he enjoyed many of the benefits that came along with total market ownership, such as price setting, higher profits. During the 35 years of being in business, other tailors would come and go and attempt to enter the market. However, entrance found hard to stay in business. Dad's product was just too good. He was just too far ahead. And it was his time of prosperity and the realization of the American dream. Next section, benefits of being maniacal. So more than anything else, dad was renowned for his maniacal attention to detail. Consider the lapel, you know, the folded flap on the, of cloth on a suit jacket that extends from the collar and folds back against the breast of the jacket or coat. Tailors have a personal preference. Who knew that, right? On the angle of the notch, which is usually between 75 to 90 degrees. But for dad's eye, it was consistently 80 degrees, not a degree more and not a degree less. And for the sleeves of the jacket, dad had to make them 9 sixteenths of an inch shorter than the shirt cuff to have the most dramatic reveal, not a quarter of an inch and God forbid an inch. And I, I remember a customer had requested an inch reveal and I thought my dad was gonna have a heart attack. So I was fortunate to have spent time with him and watch him create a, a suit stitch by stitch. And, and although to some, the boredom of watching a person sew could metaphorically kill you, to me it was the witnessing of creation and perfection. It was my first experiencing, my first experience in appreciating the details of things and I appreciated the care and attention he spent on his products because each suit represented himself, his family, his maternal country of Italy, and most important, his adopted country of America. Customers appreciated the same things. People wore his products in public with pride to weddings, meetings, for all types of events and occasions. And he often told me he declared victory only when people would comment and how amazing he made them look in his suits, not how amazing his suits were. This might seem inconsequential in the scheme of things, but it was huge. You see, for dad, his product development wasn't successful until customers realized and vocalized the value that it brought them. And the value above the obvious, which was to be clothed, was more emotional. It would make them feel good and more confident. You know, value that drives emotion rather than logic makes us do things we normally wouldn't do, such as spend money on things we really don't need. So the dopamine and endorphins, those strong chemicals in our brain that drive these feelings of happiness, you know, and, and, and the brain is such an incredible, powerful organ. As you activate these super chemicals, such as dopamine, which functions as a neurotransmitter, a chemical released by neurons to send signals to the nerve cells, and the brain responds with reward-motivated feel-good behavior little research that I did. So, so essentially, uh, as they say in the movies, all things must come to an end. And mom and dad couldn't possibly ride this way forever. And over time, the market would change. But essentially, you know, uh, that is the first, uh, uh, you know, little readout of, of, of the book. Let me kind of go back to this, to this thing here. Uh, and so I want to share that with you guys. 
Uh, we have 17, uh, 16 minutes left here. I want to open up to the group. Questions, thoughts, um, fire away. So, Leo, that was great. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions here. Um, first question I have is, what advice would you have for someone not in the industry, but looking to enter the space and develop an idea? Assume that they are looking for a tech vendor or co-founder co and assume that they already have a tech vendor and co-founder. That's like a really big question. <laughs> Um, I mean, listen, I, 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 you know, the first thing is this, you know, depend on others less and try to do as much of, of as, as you can and talk is cheap, you know, really start to put together a plan, uh, start to write things down, you know, start to really get your thoughts. I can't begin to tell you the number of times I hear, I got a great idea. I can't share it with you, but I got a great idea. I'm like, dude. I get pitched a great idea like three times an hour, you know, and ideas are a dime a dozen, literally a dime a dozen. It's all about execution. It's all about delivery. It's all about the pain, right? That you're going to endure, right? That's going to take you over and above, you know, those moments that you're going to be like, should I give up? You know, should I go back? You know, should I, you know, call it quits, right? So first and foremost, start, start, start putting things on paper, start designing. So well, I don't know where to start with designing. Listen, there are, are, apps have already been created. What do you want your app to look like? You know, you know, Google's got a great user experience. Facebook's got a great user experience. It's kind of been done over and over again or whatever it may be, right? But start, start taking pictures if it's a physical product. Start doing some wireframing, draw boxes, um, you, know, you know, buy my book. You'll learn all that stuff you need to in the book. Uh, uh, $24.99 all goes to motivating kids to code because Eric and I, we're going to change the way kids think about it, right? And we're going to drive this thought process all across the country. Right, Eric? So am I, am I allowed to talk? That's right. Absolutely. I was just going to say, go ahead. Guys. If anybody has questions for Leo, please go ahead and unmute yourself and fire away. Are you at Coles? Where, where are you, Eric? Are you at Coles? In the Coles, no, Coles. basement. Uh, I, I ordered a burger. It should be here any minute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in my basement. <laughs> kind of like Coles. Leo, uh, we had another question come in. Um, if you could do everything over, what would you have done differently to make things even better? Oh man, um, you know, listen, I, 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 I struggle with that. You know, would I do things over, would I not? If I do things over, then I wouldn't feel the pain and I wouldn't have to deal with adversity, which made me that much stronger. Uh, that's my, you know, but certainly, I mean, uh, the truth of the matter is trust. Trust is, uh, you know, it's very challenging to trust people. It's very challenging to have them continue, uh, you know, to be trusted. Uh, you meet people, people, you know, when money comes into the picture, people behave really, really differently. You know, um, you think you know people, then, then, then you, you know, uh, then you figure out that you don't, you know, and, and, and people surprise you. But trust, honesty is so important. And I would say that, you know, listen, I thought, you know, you know, Canisius te teaches us, you know, uh, morality, right? It teaches us that we operate at a different level, right? But other folks, they didn't have that training. My parents raised us that way, right? Other folks didn't have that training. So it's like, you know, taking a person's word you know, also being a lot more, um, I would say, disciplined in the operational aspect of, uh, of my endeavors, uh, which have, you know, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, you know, it's just, you know, sometimes you just, you know, 
you don't have everything as tight as as, as you think, and it, and, it, and, it, and it leads to issues. You know, it's it's an immaturity. Uh, but uh, trust and honesty incredibly important. Um, and 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 make sure that you're trustful, right, and honest. Um, because otherwise, you know, you know, you know, people will sniff you out and, the, and, and will sniff you out pretty fast, right? Um, so that's what I'd say. All right. About that. We have a couple of questions coming in here. So we'll start with uh, Nicholas. Recently funded startups in Buffalo have been of a certain type. What sort of investment activity have you seen out West and what is next? Whew, another big statement. Um, listen, I, I, I think uh, I think there's a there's a big thing happening with the trust economy. Trust is the new currency. We're seeing it right now with uh, this COVID epidemic, right? Um, people, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate, right? You know, wear your mask. Do I know they you cleaned your place? Do I know? you know, that you're being forthcoming, or that you've interacted with other folks. Um, it just, there's a sentiment of mistrust and not because people aren't trustworthy, it's just because of fear, right? So trust is the new currency. And um, so we're seeing, you know, opportunities around, around that, around building and, 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 and ultimately providing uh, more confidence in, um, in, uh, in society, in the community, right? Really building up confidence, relieving the apprehension. Uh, and that's all you can say, you know, sprinkle of um, the blockchain, right? But that's just the technology. Um, you know, a lot of IoT, inter internet of things that's real, talked about earlier. That's why kids need to know how to code because everything's becoming smart. Everything's becoming smart. And they don't just become smart on their own. You got to code it. You got to code it to make it smart. So IoT, you know, uh, trust is a currency. Um, you know, you hear some stuff about cryptocurrency. You know, take that as you wish. I think a lot of it, you know, is, is a little overblown. I do believe in digital currency. Uh, I'm not really a big subscriber into Bitcoin. Um, you know, just just because you know, I can't use it anywhere. And by the way, I'm, I'm a gatekeeper in having it accepted at Main Street businesses because, I, because I'm responsible for 4 million Main Street businesses, right? And all I have to do is flip the switch on the terminal and now you can accept Bitcoin, right? But it's, it's not trusted. So why would I do that, right? Why would I do that? So um, anyways, but uh, IoT, Trust is a currency, right? Um, you know, and 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 art, and without a doubt, it's not new, but there's a lot more emphasis on it. Artificial intelligence, AI, um, and this is not about you know Terminator, right? This is about like getting things to work smarter as an enhancer, right? To make to make our lives uh, better. Thank you. I'll be immediately divesting all of my investment in Bitcoin. <laughs> well, don't do that. But you know, I mean, uh, I mean, where are you going to use it? What are you going to buy a gift card? I mean, you know. <laughs> um, Matthew Shanslin has a, a question for you throughout the process of starting your own venture. What was the biggest risk or leap of faith that you took that ended up being the right move? Oh, man. Um, listen, I knew this was going to change our lives. I knew it. Um, you know, I'm actually surprised a lot of other people didn't know it as well as I mean, a lot, a lot of folks did. Uh, but I just like was like, I knew it. I'm like, Oh, my God, this is it. How can people not see it? I pitched investors and they couldn't see it. I'm like, what are you guys talking about? Right. So um, transacting on, on, on the phone, skipping the line. And who, who, who likes lines? except for Matt Carver, you know, who thought, I mean, right. You know, who likes lines except for, for, you know, our wonderful military personnel, right. You know, you know, most of us, we just like, like to skip the lines. Lines drive me crazy. Right. Um, Matt, no, I'm, I'm just joking. Clearly. Um, 
So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, listen, I mean, you know, that was the aha moment. Skip the line, order the coffee in advance, drive efficiencies, drive uh, enhanced productivity, paying for it on the phone, reducing all those meaningless steps and just focusing the folks. And now, by the way, everyone's ordering from their phone. Everyone's ordering online, um, you know, so uh, I'm really happy to have done my part to kind of bring that uh, to the world. Great. All right, we got about six minutes left here. A question from Nicholas. I own a 10 person digital product studio here in Buffalo. We work with a lot of startups. What advice do you have for us breaking through to help larger companies innovate? Um, you know, it starts off with credibility, right? So a lot of times it's credibility and risk. So a lot of times larger companies, although you can help them, um, you know, they want to know that you're operating in a way that is enterprise grade, uh, you know, and, and by being enterprise grade, we're talking about the RFOT, right? Um, you know, you're talking about being, how are you being transparent with them? How are you indicating that you're driving action? How are you driving accountability? How are you engaging them and participating every day? And how are you doing it, you know, with, through the positive, you know, a, a very positive winning attitude. All of that together begins to help communicate the maturity level, right, uh, of, of an organization. You can't just wing it. You can't wing it. As much as people think you just wing it in your garage, it's going to catch up with you, you know. I don't work with people who wing it. You know, show me that you deserve it, you know. Don't bullshit. Sorry, can we say that? I don't know if I can say that. <laughs> don't, 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 no BS. <laughs> The truth, want the truth, right, Eric? Want the truth, right, Eric? You know, what, what more can we ask for? This is the truth, right? Full disclosure, right? That's what these companies need. Otherwise, it's too risky of a proposition. Be incredibly meticulous in how you document how you operate, right? Be very transparent with them, you know? Uh, and then, you know, and then by doing that, and ultimately, in, in many cases, hopefully you can get a smaller project. And maybe that smaller project can, can lead can lead to someone. Not because you won't do it, you know, because you likely do it better than what they do it. But, but it's really it's a risk it's a risk item, right? You know, so um, you know, and listen, you could begin to, to to work yourself up to small to medium, and then and then to large, right? Um, publish your stuff, get it out there, you know, you know, if folks see it and they use it, right? Publish how you do things. You know, so, so you're being transparent with them. That's, that's pretty important, so. It's a great answer. We have a couple minutes left here. Well, uh, another question, um, really like this question. Regarding employees, vendors, and partners, what qualities do you look for? What do you avoid? Are there characteristics that you've noticed that others overlook or misvalue? Um, you know, I would say honesty, credibility, right? If there is any inkling that a person is not telling the truth about anything, whether it's something really small, right? Because that just leads to an integrity issue, right? And sometimes it's very unfortunate, but I've learned that some people don't know the difference between the, the, the truth and a lie or misinformation, right? It's very unfortunate. But the minute you sniff that this is, you know, this is bullshit, that begins, it brings up the question, integrity. And at that point, dude, if it's not now, it's gonna be later, uh, you're, gonna, you're, you're gonna have problems. So, trustworthy, honest, right? And, you know, and, 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 and just, if you, if you operate, you know, being that way, being transparent, right? Let me tell you, you know, you'll, you won't have any issues. Don't be the guy, don't be the bullshitter, right? Because we could smell right through it. I can't begin to tell you how much bullshit I've smelled, right? Tons, tons, 
the whole trippy field of bullshit. I've smelled it all, right? It's a big field, Eric, right? You're right? Smelled a lot of shit on that field. Uh, you've certainly broken some, some records for uh, most swears in one Zoom session. <laughs> <laughs> We'll leave, a, we'll leave the last question here from some guy named Eric Amadeo who uh, wants me to ask you what your favorite moment was when he and Matt visited you out in San Francisco last year. Oh, man. Uh, well, I, I, by the way, I had several, and I'm, you know, hopefully we, we, we can get through this stuff so you guys can come out again. Uh, I mean, dude, I, we, had, we had so many. We had so many. I, I think it was the frozen yogurt, would you say? Was it the frozen yogurt? <laughs> I missed the frozen yogurt. Wasn't the frozen yogurt? It could have been or, the, terif uh, the terrifying drive to Napa. Yeah. <laughs> we, was that? that was a fun drive. That was a fun drive at 130 miles an hour. Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> but uh, it was good. We had a blast, you know? But, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Leo. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no. That's it. Yeah. Uh, you know. So I just wanted to, uh, I just want to say thank you again for, um, for, for joining us, for taking some time out of your day. I know it's, you know, three o'clock out there right now in the middle of the day. So thanks again for joining us. We appreciate everything that you do um, for the school. Um, and uh, with that, I am going to end it. Thank you so much, Leo. Thanks, Leo, guys. Great job, buddy. Have a great day. Thank, thank you. Care, man. Take care, everyone. Go Bills.